I developed this technique to better visualize Earthshine in total eclipse photos. Now that's a very specific kind of technique, although what I'm going to be demonstrating can be used in other ways, but as it so happens, the inspiration behind it is for the total eclipse that I was lucky enough to see in 2017. Unfortunately, in the 2024 apparition for me, uh, it was cloudy, and so there is no Earthshine to be seen whatsoever. But the technique, I think, will be helpful to those who have data like this. Now, it is particular kind of data. You need to have perhaps bracketed many exposures, where some of those exposures are quite long in terms of a total eclipse. Typically, to be able to perceive Earthshine well, maybe you're taking one or two second exposures. Of course, it depends entirely on the equipment that you're using, the conditions that it's under, all of that kind of stuff. But it's long type exposures where the corona is well overexposed and it's really the moon that we're trying to capture here or at least the outer part of the corona. So if you have that kind of data you can do the technique that I'm about to demonstrate. First let's look at the earth shine that is captured in this particular data that I took in 2017. By the way I should mention just because it appears to be something that people are not aware of or familiar with the light that we're we're about to see here, once I stretch this in an appropriate way, where you can see the features of the moon, that light is reflected light off of the Earth, going up to the moon and then back to us. That's Earth shine. This is not somehow light that is going around uh, the moon from the sun and then somehow scattering or I don't know how it would work physically. It actually isn't the answer. So this is reflected light from the earth. We are a big body with respect to the moon. We send light up to it and then it bounces back to us. Now it's very faint. It's very dim. You can often see it when the moon is in a small crescent phase. And we can see it here during a total solar eclipse. But we want to be able to see it even better perhaps than uh, we're doing in the view as it appears now. Now you can do the following kinds of operations where we try to find this kind of optimum view where we're, you know, we're adjusting here the STF, which we can make permanent at any time. Uh, and, and what you'll find happens is that in order to increase the contrast, the brighter we make the image, either by adjusting the midtones value, or if I zoom out, I can even adjust the, the true white point here, Neither of those really help, and it's for the following reason. This is why I wanted a, a different way. If you look at the edge of the moon, every time you make the image brighter, the edge becomes less distinct, or the brightness actually encroaches, the surrounding brightness, if you will, encroaches in on the moon, decreasing the um, contrast in that area. So you get an artificial effect, and that artifact I didn't like. I wanted to come up with another method that would avoid that. And of course, uh, you know, the raising the black level uh, to a certain degree, again, helps, but because there is this disparity, this gradient of brightness, where some areas look quite good, other areas are going to uh, be clipped. So to me, I could never find a, a perfect balance by just adjusting in this state what the moon looks like. So now I've stated, I've shown you the earth shine, I've stated the problem, now, let me show you the solution. Just a quick note to say that this is a unique and perhaps innovative technique. It's of the type that you'll find on my website. Members of my site uh, got to enjoy this video that I made in 2017 that shows this exact process. Uh, so I hope you'll forgive me for a little self-promotion, but this is free content I'm making available. And I just want to say, if you become a member, you can see much more of this very kind of information. Now let's look at the step-by-step -step solution to improving the visibility of Earthshine in an image like this. The first step is to go ahead and make a preview that captures the moon, perhaps something like this. I'm going to be dragging this preview out to make it its own independent image in a moment. But before I do, uh, a prerequisite is to permanently stretch the image because we need the image to be non-linear in order to use HDRMT, which is what we're about to do. So I'm going to choose our, you know, screen transfer function here, our STF as it is, and permanently stretch the image like this. Reset that. Now we can drag this image out. We will reset its STF, and we're ready to go. We're going to be making an adjustment to this image, applying HDRMT to improve the visibility of the Earth shine. 
HDRMT normally is used on a bright nebula or a galaxy where you decrease the dynamic range making the very overwhelming bright parts much more similar to the fainter parts of the image and thereby allowing you to see the detail and structure that was otherwise hidden by all of that kind of excess light. In this sense, we can't do that here. The moon is not of the right tonal sense. It's dark, it's not bright. So we're going to invert the tonal uh, format of the moon, making it a bright image. This is what allows us to use now HDRMT to improve the contrast of these features of the craters and of the mare. This has a big benefit. The whole point of this trick is now the background is dark. What is all of these? These are all saturated pixel white values in the original image. In HDRMT, the way it works is that it's going to decrease that dynamic range, but only up to the point of the, you know, where the threshold of the sky is. So it's not going to change the brightness here which will allow us to put it back more easily into the original image, and it'll maintain especially the limb of the moon because it's the artifact around the limb because of that saturation here that is the, the part that I really want to try to control. So we'll now apply HDRMT. We're going to use a lightness mask, and I don't know exactly what parameters are best, so I'll make a preview so we can kind of iteratively find what are optimal values. Let's apply what this is and see what we get. Ah, there, now you can see there are craters. You can see the mare, the seas of the moon. I can see Copernicus with its rays going across the moon. So this isn't bad, although I would like to, if we can, try to improve again this edge, try to get contrast to go as close to the edge as possible. So to do that, we'll uh, try to change a parameter. Let's, for example, change the number of layers. Now, I suspect what this will do is to make smaller features more obvious, whereas the larger ones kind of blend in. And that isn't actually the direction that I want to go. I want to be sure the seas are more visible because we're not going to be zoomed into the moon when we look at the final result here. We're going to see the moon and the earth shine, but also the corona surrounding. So I prefer the larger number of layers here. And uh, then we can change the scaling function. Smaller scaling functions are going to do exactly what I just demonstrated, where we're going to accentuate the small structure features. I find that uh, the Gaussian tends to be a good one to use. You can do Gaussian 5 there. We can try Gaussian 7 and see how it performs. Ah, you see how we're uh, not improving that edge by going larger. So perhaps sticking with the Gaussian 5 is not terrible. It helps. And this is actually what I chose when I rendered my 2017 result, which I'll show you here in the end. These are the parameters that I actually used. However, we can still play around a little bit more. What happens if we choose the median transform? Watch the edge here, and you'll find that it even goes a little bit further, I think, giving it, uh, again, a more natural view. I like that. Although, again, we've lost uh, the contrast in the large features here. So to compensate for that, uh, we would use a larger number of layers. It, they're not equivalent when you use median transform in this uh, other method, these other scaling functions. So yeah, see now we can see some of the larger features. We can see the craters. We can basically see everything that we want to see. That might be the best setting. And if I were doing it today, this might be the direction I would go. Of course, we need to invert this back to the, the original uh, form. So again, I'm going to do Control I. And there is the moon in its original form. But that didn't help me <laughs> because this is on the preview. I, I, let me delete the preview so I don't get confused. We need to do this to the original image. So we go like this. Now I do control I and there we have the earth shine moon. Now it's a little noisy. So in a moment, perhaps we'll apply a uh, noise exterminator to the image. But you gotta be careful sometimes with small images like this uh, noise exterminator, these, um, these kinds of programs that tile the image. If there's not enough tiles, it gets all confused. So I'm going to actually substitute this back in first, and then we'll apply the noise exterminator. Uh, but not bad, right? I mean, we can see kind of uh, looks like the moon. Let's go ahead and use a nice script to do this. Uh, there is a developer that I worked with to make this substitute script, which is, this is a perfect application for it. If you haven't seen my video on this, it's another YouTube video where I 
explain all of the different ways you can use this particular script. But in this case, all I have to do is specify the source and the place, the target, where we're going. The source image is this one, the Earthshine underscore mean. Uh, so that is what's selected. And the target view is here. That's just Earthshine mean, straight up. And if I hit run, there it is. It gets put in place. So I'll go ahead and apply noise exterminator like this. And now we have an Earthshine moon. And we have an edge which is really much cleaner, and it's actually better than what I originally did. Now, what I'm not showing here is how to composite. So this uh, corona is the overexposed corona, and that's what allowed me to, you know, kind of do the earth shine here. But I took this image and I blended it with other versions of the corona doing its own compositing HDR uh, kind of uh, manipulation in order to get the final result. Let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. So this is what I did in 2017. And you can see that the edges here still show a little bit of loss of contrast from that brightness, whereas the choice that I just made actually I think does it a little bit more interesting. It's a little bit cleaner and I like it better. But there you go. This is how you can improve the visibility of Earthshine in your images. And I hope you find this uh, a, a new technique that you can use in your, for those that had clear skies, uh, in your 2024 total eclipse data. If you feel like you benefited from content like this or from other videos on my site, I have quietly made a Patreon page. I'll have a link down below in the description. Uh, and I would encourage you, of course, please, I could use the support. You'll find that not only do I make content available to Patreon support um, of my, uh, my endeavors, but you'll also get in return some benefits. You, you have access to some videos on my site, as well as some other things. You'll see that I am undertaking a very large project. So please like and subscribe. Let me know what you thought of this video and if you find that it helps with your Eclipse uh, pictures. And uh, until next time, clear skies, and I look forward to catching up with you then.